Welcome to the New Thinking for a New World podcast, where we explore the most pressing issues that are challenging and changing our societies. We are looking for new thinking and new solutions wherever we can find them. Listen as host Alan Stoga, the Talberg Foundation's chairman, challenges his guests for analysis, ideas and actions. Together, we can help make our world at least a bit better. At times of rapid societal change, like those we are now living through, the academy can be a radical platform for experimentation and new thinking, or a bastion of conservatism. Indeed, within any great university, there are inevitably competing views about the right mix of experimentation, an unchanging principle, about whether society ought to change, and about the sustainable pace of change as that inevitably occurs. These issues are important in periods of profound social and economic political transformation, like the 60s. They may be even more vital in times of accelerating technological changes, like today, when the contours of literally what is life, what does it mean to be human, are being debated. Does a research university have a special obligation to think about those kinds of issues and to think about the ethics of what's happening in its laboratories? How do university leaders prepare students not just to cope with this kind of change, but to lead in a world which is changing at an exponential pace? Indeed, what do you teach today that won't be irrelevant literally tomorrow? The University of Pavia was established by Emperor Charles IV in 1361, making it one of the oldest universities in the world. Francesco Svelto, a distinguished electrical engineer, is now the university's rector. He has the remarkable opportunity to build a university of the future on a centuries-old foundation. Welcome, Francesco, to New Thinking for a New World. Thank you. Let's talk about Pavia to start. What is special about your university, other than that it is one of the oldest there is? I would say that uh, our university, being in Pavia, is one example of uh, uh, a uh, city campus university. With that, I mean that uh, the university and the city are a kind of indistinguishable because uh, uh, I would say that the city is very old, but the university, as you were uh, saying, uh, is 660 years old and they have grown up together. So uh, if you think about uh, U.S. campus, uh, they are slightly different. Let's think about Stanford, Berkeley, or even Harvard. You have a campus uh, where, which is dedicated to institutions, departments, and students, uh, to dorms, uh, and whatever. Uh, Pavia as a city campus is more similar to a U.K. Uh, campus. I can think about more like to Oxford or Cambridge in U.K., where you have uh, all the institutions that are spread over the city. What does it mean? Uh, this means that uh, we uh, also accommodate all the students in the city, and uh, the city is almost indistinguishable with uh, the university institutions. So uh, somehow I would say that is, it is an open uh, institution where students live here, live in the city, and are very open to, to the society. So in, somehow I want to include students inside, but make them very open to all the society solicitation. Let's talk about 661 years. I, I want to discuss the blending of old and new. Uh, I know you are in the process of reimagining what the campus looks like, what the buildings look like, how to accommodate the future. Uh, from an architectural perspective, but also an educational perspective, I'm a firm believer that, that context matters. How, for your students, your faculty, your researchers, what is it like to be surrounded by literally hundreds of years of beauty and antiquity, but to be thinking about modern and, and more importantly, future problems? Does it promote a different way of learning, do you think? Well, let me say that in these years, Pavia is uh, 
in a in a very interesting and dynamic period of time because uh, in few years we will be renovating renewing and building almost 70% 70% of all our university buildings this in particular means that in the historical portion of the city where we have uh, very nice and uh, historical places we are profoundly renovating everything i would say that most of these uh, places and buildings have uh, maybe even more than 1000 years and were housing monasteries noble buildings and now we are uh, we are renovating them in such a way that uh, students can live uh, in really beauty places with uh, paintings of hundreds centuries hundreds of years back besides this r- renovation of buildings in the city center we are also looking at all uh, the new area that is expanding in in pavia where we are uh, building uh, the scientific portion technological and medical areas and in that case what we we urge to do is uh, making available laboratories modern infrastructure and places so that the students can really have uh, the right mix between a beauty place historical and at the same times very uh, new infrastructures and possibilities of experiments looking at the future so my my way is uh, having the students in town living a, a really human oriented experience where education is a primary aspect but also growing up with uh, uh, friends colleagues and teachers is a main a main aspect of this of this experience from the students point of view that sounds fantastic do you think it changes how they learn or how they develop being surrounded by beauty and history but also with access to the fabulous machinery of modern infrastructure i i think so absolutely because i think that you know when when you live in a beauty place with interesting palace and uh, and it's a privilege now what is very important is that the idea that, that the companies use so that's the role of the university or and of the board of director is uh, uh, leveraging all the strong aspects and look at the future what i mean is if we were just thinking about pavia is a, an historical place by the way pavia has been the only university in all the lombardia region for more than 500 years this means that for more than 500 years milan didn't have any university pavia was also the university of milan now what what i mean is that leveraging such an historical uh, aspect is really key at the same time you need to be far sighted and just say sign the future for your students so that they can be proud and think about i'm here where for example there was alessandro volta teaching where for example there was uh, camillo golgi uh, a, a, a nobel prize of some years ago where a lot of medical medical uh, discoveries uh, have been done but that's not enough because i'm a young guy i want to look at the future so i need the new administration to tell me what's the future to give me a link to future to my future uh, career meaning companies meaning research meaning whatever the society can offer so what's very important is the right mix between being proud of living in such an historical place but having a far sighted environment let me pull on one of those threads and ask you how you and your board think about the role of the university in society you you've talked a lot about students already clearly education you are an educational institution it's about students um uh, but it's also about preparing i would think students for future as leaders 
about interacting with society, the model you've described in, in Pavia. What is the core of the university's role from your perspective? I think that nowadays it's very important that we react to all the stimulus that society is giving. For example, we are assisting to an impressive acceleration of many research fields where think about a a doctor, I wouldn't say of the future, but even a doctor of today that doesn't have any knowledge about technology, about uh, uh, some engineering aspects. How can he be a good surgeon and how can he be a good uh, good to, to make diagnosis if he doesn't know anything about engineering? So what we are doing with uh, our university is trying to mix the different knowledge so that a, a, a student at the end of his path will, will really have many different disciplines and afterwards, during his work, he will be uh, uh, conscious of what's behind many things that he will use as, for a, in the case of a doctor, as a doctor. But we, I, I can repeat the same example with many other, in many other fields. So in our university, we are making an effort to uh, mix the disciplines and uh, help our students to have an actual multidisciplinary or interdisciplinary uh, education. Do the students understand why that's so important? Uh, I would say so. I mean, in in some cases, I'll I'll give you an example. Because of this opportunity of being a city campus, I'm also doing something which is really new, I would say, Uh, because uh, some of our classes, uh, starting last academic years, are delivered in one of our 16 colleges. These uh, these classes uh, are classes that are that can complete the education in the several areas where we teach at University of Pavia. But at the same time, some of these classes are very transverse. Like you can say, here uh, you can have a, a class about sustainability, about environment, about politics, about public speaking, and in that case they decide to access these classes or they do not. Now, depending on how attractive is such a class and how attractive is uh, the the teacher, because in that case, I I select teachers also from outside the university, maybe a big journalist, maybe another professor of another place, maybe a manager of a company. Now, depending on the attractiveness of the teacher and the class, I eventually have hundreds of requests to come to that class. So this means that, that they understand and appreciate this, despite being a, an engineer or a student of engineering or a student of uh, philosophy, they want to access this transversal course. So this means they understand. They meet, need to be open and they need to have uh, more more knowledge and and be interested in many disciplines. At the same, in, in, in the example of before, where I said for students of medicine, we offer also engineering. In that case, it depends. Maybe the, someone tells them it's important you know those things. At the same time, it's a little bit challenging for them. So they say, I become a doctor, then I know something more. And it's a kind of challenging aspect and they are solicited to participate also because of that. So I would say, in some sense, they understand. That's the direction. In other case, they understand it's challenging. They want to compete and they want to do the more they can. So I would say they understand and they are, and they are keen to new stimulus. If you feel that the world lacks global leaders, please help support the Talberg Foundation programs. Individual donations are being accepted at talbergfoundation.org slash donate. That's T-A-L-L-B-E-R-G foundation.org slash donate. As you know better than I, one of the challenges that many universities in Europe as well as in the United States face is that we're not making enough students. Uh, Literally, the decline of populations, particularly young people coming into university age, 
So you have in many places, colleges going out of business. I mean, literally not being able to fill the room. Your building and rebuilding the university obviously is a statement that you expect that's not going to be a challenge. The demand for education is not going to be a challenge for you. Where are the students going to come from? Thank you very much. That, this is a very smart and interesting question. And I, I would start saying that it's not true that I think that Pavia will not suffer from a possible, uh, possible uh, decrease in the number of students. Now, the point is, if I look at the future, what's my strategy? And my strategy is we are a university campus and the way is being more a university campus. And the pandemia told me uh, that this is absolutely the way to go. What do I mean? If we are a kind of intermediate, uh, uh, in an intermediate situation where we are not anymore a really uh, city campus, meaning that, okay, University of Pavia is in Pavia, but nothing more than that. It has been in this way for centuries and at some point, you don't even understand what's the difference between a university in Pavia and university in Milan, then this is not the right strategy. The right strategy is saying, come here because this is where a students in those five years, seven years, whatever it is, need to be to have the real university flavor, which means a human experience and the same place for all the students, the same institutional research, but also also places where they, they play music, where you drink a beer, all easy to reach in 15 minutes. So in that sense, I said, I need to be attractive. In order to be attractive, I need to have more places to accommodate the students in the city, and I need to be to, to, to share the beauty of the city with them. The city has become more smarter more easy to live for students. And we the, the, real play, the real game is, of course, going on attracting Italian students, but being more and more open to international students. And in this sense, I think it's even more important to be a smart city campus because then you say, okay, I'm a young student. I want to go to be a student. Maybe you can go to Rome, but Rome, it's not a, the perfect place to go to study. Maybe it's the perfect place to go to visit the, maybe one of the best historical place in the world. But if you go as a student, you miss many things that a, a, a city campus like our has not, has not to, to forget. So I, I feel the challenge, uh, but my answer and strategy is let's be more and more a city campus. So more students in town, let's go everywhere to attract international students and say, here you should come. Does that mean that over time the university becomes less Italian? Exactly. Sure. And is your ambition at the Europe scale, at the regional scale, at the global scale, Ten years from now, do you want to be considered a global platform of learning? Again, it's the mission question in part. We need to, to see a little bit um, how uh, Italian university have grown up and how they are uh, financed today. Because most of them, and Pavia is one of them, are paid by government. So this is why they have historically been you, uh, looking at uh, education of Italian guys because mainly the business uh, was limited and most of the money was coming from government. Now, in, in, I, I don't think uh, because of this uh, uh, fin financing aspect that we will uh, change immediately uh, going to international students and uh, uh, becoming immediately a global university. But the direction is that one. And uh, uh, I would say that, I, I'm not sure in 10 years, but in, uh, in, in the future direction is being more and more attractive for international students. And do you do that in your imagination with international partners? Do you do it mostly with your own DNA and your own resources how do you work at scale globally? 
Well, international partners will will be uh, for sure one opportunity to uh, to grow uh, globally. Um, well, for example, we we are uh, hosting courses for students, U.S. students from U.S. universities. Examples are Tufts University. Another example has been. Uh, Gainesville in Florida, then uh, uh, University of Illinois. So we are receiving students for maybe short periods for one semester in town. So uh, going on with uh, some uh, uh, links with the international university is one way of our approach. At the same time, I can also say that we can do more going into other maybe countries or even even uh, oversee uh, to develop a, an Italian university, maybe together with other universities, and try to think about those students as being possible candidates to come and uh, grow up in Italy. For example, I'm thinking about Africa as one possible uh, target. Let me segue back to technology. There's been an awful lot of attention recently to what's called generative artificial intelligence in the United States. This is around the uh, chat GPT application, uh, which essentially harnesses the computing power of, of the cloud with some very fancy logarithms to create uh, a, effectively a search engine that produces reasonably decent answers in well-written tonality, fantastic research tool, but also it is scaring the daylights out of academics all over the place, wondering how they'll teach in the future. And, and this is sort of a silly example at the moment, but it's headed in the right direction, that clearly the power of AI, the increasing understanding of how the brain works, the merger between those two, neuroscience and artificial intelligence, has got to, in some ways, be a profound challenge to someone in your business of the academy. Not just how do you keep students from cheating? You can't. Students always cheat. Been, been true for the last couple thousand years will always be true. That's not the issue. The issue is how do you, how do you get students to learn and how do you leverage that technology? Or maybe how do you just let the technology do all the work? This is another very good question. Well, apart from saying that we're going to have a, a seminar or an open discussion, and I will take part to this open discussion next week about ChatGPT as an example. Uh, but more in general, I would say that this is a very, a, a very interesting and probably the most recent example. But if we look also at many other aspects about technology, we can say that uh, there are a plenty of uh, novelties that are probably going to change the way we need to look at educating, meaning in some sense that we need to use the technology in the best way and not wait saying, okay, uh, uh, education has been that way for many years and it will continue in that way. If we speak in business terms, some of the things that we were used to do and the way we were delivering our contents now are becoming more commodities. Uh, so technology is stimulating us uh, to change the way we can teach. I, I make an example. In the future, I expect teaching becoming more and more student-centered. Uh, so I'm not being at, in class for 40 minutes and I took my own and the student just listen and write down what I'm saying, maybe formulas and whatever without any interaction. The basic things can be even registered and delivered to the students, but the methods, uh, the analysis, the, the direction to the students still has to be given by a professor or by someone else. So the way you could think about it is I can provide many, many more things that I used to do. For example, we have always been giving 
the students a book uh, uh, or, or, or notes. Uh, now probably we can also give a video recording of our cl- standard classes, but when we call them in class, we try to make a more experience-based uh, class and maybe we also try to ask them and understand if we are, they are really connecting all the different nodes of the network and understand the problems and do the, the right question. So to completely uh, answer your question, I think that technology is probably giving us many opportunities and we need to understand when things that we were used to teach or uh, are now uh, more easy to find in, in, uh, in the cloud or we can record ourselves and innovate our education placing the student at the center of the game. That sounds like an enormous challenge because you're flipping the model around first. And second, it requires probably demands that the student be better than maybe students have sometimes been in the past because you're putting them in charge of their education in in a sense. They will come out with a better education, no doubt, but don't you run the risk of losing a lot of people along the way? Well, correct. We couple this strategy together with classes where students are grouped in uh, in few people, like 10 people, 12 people with a tutor. Can be an older student, can be a PhD student, can be a professor. And in these uh, small groups, uh, we have a surplus of teaching, of exercises, of interaction, where they can raise all the questions they have when they are not understanding, so that they don't lose track. So somehow we need to stimulate their 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 attention. At the same time, we need to be sure that, that we are not losing. Uh, I'm thinking now more to the, the first year, for example, where think about scientific uh, curriculum, uh, in that case, we have mathematics, physics. The first year is very is very uh, challenging for the students. In that case, we, we make these small groups. At the same time, probably uh, teaching all, all the years the same thing from the professor in, uh, on the board with 300 of people in class, uh, probably it's easier to record that standard explanation, but then go and see... Are you really, what's your problem in small groups? Yeah, it is clear. And it is about breaking down the model. I remember when I was in college many, many decades ago, the biggest classes were always taught uh, to freshmen, probably when they actually ought to have more individualized attention, as you just described. And the smallest classes were in graduate school when you probably could be absorbing things in a different way. So it is about rethinking the model. So, Francesco, let's end with this. Uh, You are a leader in what arguably is either the oldest or second oldest profession in the world. Some things never change and some things change constantly. And clearly, you are a change agent working very hard to change how not just an individual institution functions, but how a sector functions, how people learn. So let me end by asking a very simple question. What is your theory of change? How, how do we make change happen? Well, thank, thanks a lot for this question. Um, my, my attitude is the following. Uh, I, I think that the university has to be in, 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 in the middle between the young generation and society. So what I mean is that I need to tell them, come here, I will, we will educate you, but even more, we will join you in, in some sense to your future, which will mean your job, your work, your happiness, if we can. And the way we do it is, that's why I said before, uh, preparing an inclusive place where you will have a relation with your friends, you will have the opportunity to make sports, to grow up and to be educated. So in this sense, how do I look at the change? I look in this way. 
uh, I think if uh, there is something that now the society is providing and delivering and giving me and to my colleagues in the university that can help to have a better uh, education and uh, to change the way we educate, why should not go in that direction? We need to do it because otherwise the stimulus versus young guys will be weaker and weaker. So if they can find in other places what we, uh, and maybe more available, what we pretend to tell them in a class, there's no reason why they should come. So uh, if technology or in general progress is telling us that we need to change and to look at the future, still remaining the, the a reference for the young generation and for the future after education, then we need to go in that direction. This is the way I look at change. So I don't want to change just because it has to be done. I think a lot about it, but at some point I say, if there's something we can do better, leveraging technology or whatever, not only technology, we need to do it. If it's just because uh, others are doing, not necessarily I want to do. As I told you before, I don't see, I don't believe to uh, e-learning universities to replace universities like my university, like Harvard University, like Stanford or whatever. They are doing a different job. In my view, they can be perfect to upskilling, reskilling for workers, for whatever. But if I think about being in the middle between a young guy and his future, I think I need to do many more things, but still leverage technology to change. Otherwise, there's no reason why they should come to me, to my class, if at some point it's just a commodity. So I think that younger teacher can, of course, will come first. The older one will be more conservative. But at the end of the game, if I push them, if I stimulate in, in a good way, we will go to the, this change in a, in, a, in a relatively fast way. Well, thank you for that. And thank you for this conversation. These are important topics we need to keep on revisiting. We are in an era of change. We can't manage it, but we need to leverage it. And, and that's what you're trying to do at the University of Pavia. So thank you very much, Francesco. Alan, th thank you very much. Thank you for joining us. Please rate our show on Apple Podcast and subscribe. Meanwhile, you can find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Or you can subscribe to our newsletter at talbergfoundation.org to learn more about our work. That's T-A-L-L-B-E-R-G foundation.org. Thank you, and we'll be back again next week for another episode of Talberg's New Thinking for a New World. This podcast was brought to you through the generous support of SNF, the Stavros Niarchos Foundation. <laughs>